welcome and thank you all for bringing the rain. Very much appreciated. I'm not going to complain today. So talking a little bit about emergency and critical care in the shelter and in the spay neuter clinic. I sat there and I went, how am I going to address emergency, like all of emergency and critical care for shelter, spay neuter clinics? I don't even know what the most common things are and there's so many most common things. How do you cover that in 50 minutes? So I kind of decided maybe the best approach with, to this was kind of to cover, because I think of most of the diseases that I deal with that come in really emergently have some form of shock associated with them. So I decided to kind of talk a little bit about shock and then use cases that have other little tidbits kind of associated, embedded within the case to give us a little bit more information and hopefully you'll get something out of it. Um, so off we go. So just briefly, remember shock is basically inadequate um, ability to make ATP at the cellular level and 99.9% .9 of the time that is due to inadequate oxygen delivery to those cells. Uh, we see different stages of shock. We can have very early shock where, especially in healthy animals, they're able to compensate. You may not even recognize that patient as being in shock. We have the middle stage of shock where things are advancing and they're starting to compensate and then eventually they start to lose the ability to compensate. And that's when we progress into late and then when they start to brady down, that's usually terminal shock and you're not going to pull them back. Um, so it is a progression and our goal here is to stop it before it progresses. So there, we also think about shock as far as four different basic types. Um, kind of thinking about it, when I think about shock, I think about what's happening in the body. The cells are screaming to the body for more oxygen delivery, and that really involves the heart as the pump, the vasculature as the circuit, and then you have to have a volume within the circuit for the heart to pump around. And so in a normal patient, the heart's pumping well away, cells start screaming for more oxygen, the circuit adjusts and constricts to get blood to the appropriate places, you have adequate volume to get there, everything works well. In a hypovolemic patient, the heart is working really well, and the circuit is constricting, trying to get the blood to those target tissues, especially the brain and the heart, because that's what's going to keep you alive. Um, the problem is there's just not enough volume for the heart to pump around. And then when we have distributive shock, we have a heart that's working fairly well, and you may have adequate volume in the circuit, the problem is the circuit's really flaccid and unresponsive, so the volume's in all the wrong places. And so that results in, adequate, in inadequate oxygen delivery to some of those tissues. And then last but not least, we have cardiogenic shock, where it's the pump that's broken. So the tissues are screaming, we need more oxygen, the circuit constricts to shoot oxygen to the heart and the brain. But the heart that's diseased, who can't already handle the volume that it's got, then gets this increased volume coming back to it because of the vasoconstriction, and that makes things worse. So cardiogenic shock is a failure of the pump. With hypovolemic shock, it's by far the most common type of shock that we see. And again, it's a critical loss of intravascular volume. And the degree of shock depends on the animal's overall health status, number one. But even in normal animals, it's going to really depend on the volume of blood or the volume that's been lost. So think about when you draw blood from a healthy animal to, as a blood donor for transfusion, you can, we standardly target about 10% of their blood volume as very safe to take. And we don't put those patients into shock, right? So we can take 10% very easily. And that's reflected in data as well that up to about 15% of total blood volume being acutely lost, those animals do fine and healthy animals can compensate quite well. And you probably aren't going to even recognize that they're in shock. As we progress and we have increased blood volume losses, then you're going to start getting into early shock. And that's when you're getting into a 15 to 30 percent blood volume. And as you exceed roughly 30 percent of your blood volume being lost, or your circulatory volume, I should say, then you're going to start seeing those classic signs of shock that we all recognize. The animal who's not quite mentally appropriate, who's very weak, maybe hypotensive. And as we move down that gradient, things get worse. So what are the different ways that we can develop hypovolemic shock? Where does the volume go? And the way I think of it is, well, I can have hemorrhage, and it needs to be acute, significant hemorrhage, right? If I just have a small GI ulcer and I'm losing a little bit of blood every day, I can compensate for that. So to have hypovolemic shock due to hemorrhage, it needs to be acute, significant hemorrhage. The other most common way that I develop hypovolemic shock is through severe dehydration. We think probably once we start reaching a dehydration level of 10, 12%, that's probably enough loss of volume to, or enough loss of fluid within the body uh, to actually start affecting volume status. 
Um, and then there are other ways, but those are the two big ones. And I guess the other one I just mentioned here is third spacing. It's not super common, though, to effuse really rapidly so much volume into my abdomen that I'm going to be in hypovolemic shock just from that. So really the most common things we see, acute significant blood loss, and then the dehydration. So think about the hemoabdomen. Maybe it's a trauma. And then think about um, the uh, DKA who can't concentrate their urine, who's nauseous and vomiting, and so they get so dehydrated that then they become hypovolemic and shocking. All right. So hypovolemic shock, clinically, this is, I think, something most of us are pretty comfortable with, the clinical signs. Um, they're going to be pale, prolonged, most of the time when we recognize it anyway. Pale, uh, prolonged capillary refill time, tachycardic, weak peripheral pulses, and cold extremities. And this is in that moderate, moving towards severe category. So this is easily recognized. Distributive shock is a little bit different. And again, that's a failure of that circuit or peripheral vascular failure. And there are lots of different things that can cause distributive shock. By far, the most common is sepsis. So most of the patients that we see in the hospital with distributive shock that have that failure of that vascular circuit, they're septic patients. They have an infectious disease process that's now affecting them systemically. So distributive shock is different clinically, especially in dogs. So it's very hyperdynamic, especially earlier. We have these hyperemic mucous membranes, really rapid capillary refill time. They'll have warm extremities. The cells are saying, hey, we need more oxygen. Shunt it to us, but the circuit can't constrict. So it's actually inappropriate for them to have warm feet, to have these injected. That's vasodilation in inappropriate beds where the blood doesn't need to be. It should be at the core. Um, these patients will oftentimes often have stronger than normal pulses, um, and that's due to the vasodilation as well. Late distributive shock can progress to a hypodynamic phase that looks much more like hypovolemic shock, pale, et cetera. And that's really getting into very late distributive shock. Cardiogenic shock, the other big one that we see, again, is a failure of the pump itself. The pump that's trying to circulate that volume. And cardiogenic shock means failure of forward flow. Lucky for us, most of these patients have also congestive heart failure at the same time, which is where fluid backs up into, from the left side into the lungs, from the right side into the abdominal cavity, viscera, so ascites, et cetera. So it's pretty rare, actually, to have a patient come in that's in cardiogenic shock that isn't also in concurrent congestive heart failure. So that helps us a bit in sorting out the likelihood of cardiogenic shock in a patient that's sitting there that's just shocking. We're trying to sort out what's going on. Cardiogenic shock in dogs, it's going to be due to primary heart disease, whether it's valvular disease, a bad arrhythmia, dilated cardiomyopathy, and in cats, usually a form of cardiomyopathy. Clinical signs are more similar to hypovolemic shock. Again, the circuit's working, so they're vasoconstricted. That means they're cold, they're pale. Now, I admit this video, the dog's a little bit pinker than probably the average hypovolemic or cardiogenic shock patient, but it's a nice slow CRT, and I don't have a better video yet. So um, that's why I went ahead and used it. This CRT is just too slow, all right? And that's like a three-second CRT that's just too slow. All right, again, these patients will have evidence of heart disease, murmur, arrhythmia, and a cat especially gallop rhythm. And most will have concurrent heart failure. So they may be tachypnic, they may have evidence of pleural effusion or pulmonary edema, et cetera. So in assessing these patients that come in that we're um, that we want to determine whether they're in shock or not. We have lots of things available to us just through our physical exam. Um, so physical exam, patients who are shocky may be a little bit quiet, may not be as alert, or they may actually be comatose. So but they're not usually bright and alert. Um, they may be a little bit weak. They, may have, they should have a fast heart rate for the most part. Pulse quality could be variable, mucous membrane color, et cetera. So we have physical exam parameters that we can use. But don't forget, we also have some objective measurements that are pretty readily available and aren't super expensive to implement. Things like blood pressure. Um, you can measure a lactate, which can be useful. It goes up um, in most patients with shock. And a base deficit. So I'd expect a more negative uh, base deficit, um, a metabolic acidosis in a patient who isn't perfusing their tissues well. So going to move into some cases at this point. I just want to do a brief overview of shock, and then we'll apply some of those principles. And I'll throw in a few other clinical tidbits as we move through the cases. But the rest of this presentation is going to be kind of case-based. 
So Beaster was our first patient, and Beaster is a four-year-old castrated male domestic short hair who is being presented for acute lethargy and inappetence. The owners report that he was acting completely normal last night, and he's just not himself this morning, and he is an indoor-outdoor cat. On physical exam, his temperature is 99.8, heart rate 200, respiratory rate 48, and he's about 6 kilo. His mucous membranes are light pink, and his capillary refill time is about 2 seconds. He is quiet and weak, and tachypnic with a normal effort and normal bronchovesicular sounds. In the ER, we get a blood pressure, which is a little bit too low, um, with a mean of 62. And so we go ahead and place an IV catheter and get a small aliquot of blood. So looking at our quick assessment tests, our quants, we have a PCV, total solids, blood glucose, and azo. Which of those values is most concerning to you in the context of this patient? Total solids. Ooh, maybe my tidbit isn't going to be as informative for a large part of this audience. All right. Total solids, absolutely. Or maybe I'm old enough that maybe I've trained a few of you. Who knows? Um, so total solids is the thing that catches my eye for sure in the context of this patient. And so now why? Um, anecdotally, I use a number of six. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that in a minute. But in an adult animal, I expect their total solids probably be in the mid sixes to mid sevens, maybe up into eight, you know, low eights. While our normal ranges are oftentimes 5.5 to 8.5 and pretty broad, that's a bell-shaped curve usually, and the majority of them are going to be in the middle. So think about your normal healthy animal. I would argue total solids are probably the vast majority of the time kind of in the 6.5, 7.5 or so range if they're completely healthy and well hydrated. When I get an adult animal presenting to me for acute illness, and remember I'm an emergency clinician, so that's pretty much what I see, um, then I get worried that there could be acute hemorrhage there. And as an emergency clinician, I kind of want to rule that up or down before I go home and sleep at night. Because that's a big thing to miss. So the question is, with acute hemorrhage, significant hemorrhage, why isn't the PCV in total solids normal, right? I was taught that at least initially it would be normal when I was in vet school, and I know that's still taught all over the place. And again, anecdotally, I'll tell you, we rarely see it. I think in my whole career, twice, I've seen that phenomenon. But I can explain why we see this low total solids much more commonly. So let's imagine that a little bunny comes along and rips my arm off. And I am filling buckets of blood very rapidly. So again, really important to use those modifiers of acute, significant blood loss. Because what's going to happen in the body with acute, significant blood loss is those baroreceptors are immediately detecting decreased stretch. That's going to result in decreased static levels of parasympathetic tone, which allows for a higher level of sympathetic tone to be transmitted to the heart. So what happens? My heart rate kicks up immediately. That increased sympathetic tone is, then goes down the sympathetic trunk to the adrenal glands and triggers a release of catecholamine. And that's happening within seconds of that little bunny ripping my arm off. All right? And so then I have this um, surge of epinephrine circulating throughout my body. And what does that do? but it causes vasoconstriction of my smooth muscle, of my vascular and throughout, vasculature and throughout my tissues. And dogs and cats apparently are much better than people in that they sit there with their spleen kind of full of packed red blood cells. That's kind of the normal state of a happy spleen. Remember, the spleen is full of smooth muscle. So when that surge comes through of catecholamines and causes that smooth muscle to constrict, that spleen, that engorged spleen full of just hanging on those packed red, those red blood cells, squeezes down and those red blood cells squeeze out into the circulation. Mother Nature was pretty smart. And that's almost like a little, you know, my own little endogenous packed blood cell transfusion that happens within seconds. So that will explain why in an acute significant hemorrhage patient, the PCV is oftentimes actually high, might be normal, might be low, depending on where you capture them in time, and depending how strong the response was, all of those things will play into it but really common for that to be the PCV to be fairly normal or even high in acute significant hemorrhage. Doesn't explain why the total solids is low though because as I'm filling those buckets of blood, I'm losing the protein and the fluid portion of my blood all at the same time. So how do I get less protein? That doesn't make sense. But it does if you take it back to physiology again, because it always goes back to physiology. If I could sit through those physiology lectures again now, how much more would I get out of it? I thought when I came to Cornell I'd be able to do that. No such luxury. Way too busy. So think about Starling's forces. So remember way back 
Um, you have intravascular oncotic pressure holding fluid in the vessel, intravascular hydrostatic pressure pushing out. In the interstitium, you have oncotic pressure pulling fluid out of the vessel, but the interstitial um, hydrostatic pressure is pushing it in. And there's a normal flux of water across that endothelial membrane all the time. But remember, proteins can't move freely across that membrane, can they? So all of a sudden, the bunnies rip my arm off. I'm bleeding into buckets. What's happening to my intravascular hydrostatic pressure? It has plummeted. So now that interstitial hydrostatic pressure immediately, that water can rush across all of those capillaries. And there are millions of capillaries in the body. And that happens pretty immediately. So the water rushes into the vascular space, diluting the protein that's left. Make sense? Now, the protein's starting to be mobilized through special channels, et cetera, but it can't equilibrate immediately, and it's going to take hours to days for that to happen. So again, it's really important to understand this is with an acute, significant bleed. Not unexpected to have a high or normal PCV, but that total cell of less than six is a pretty good trigger. Now, I've talked about, now this is admittedly, the physiology is real. The number is anecdotal, all right? But it served me well. And we've talked about wanting to do a study to figure out if we can publish what is the exact right number. The problem is I can't do it in clinical patients because I'd have to know for sure they aren't bleeding anywhere in their body. And how am I going to do that to know confidently? So I'd kind of have to buy a colony of beagle dogs, right? Because beagles are this, the breed that is always picked on. And I'd have to bleed them out significantly with no benefit of any anesthesia or sedation because that would blunt the whole physiologic response. And I don't really want to do that study. So it's all anecdotal, but I'm telling you it served me really well as an emergency clinician. So lowish total solids, lower than you're expecting, especially that cutoff of six. Just do some things to ensure that you don't have obvious significant hemorrhage somewhere before you go home and sleep. So where are the places we can hemorrhage significantly? Well, obviously, if they're spurting across the room, that's pretty intuitive. The peritoneal cavity, obviously, the thoracic cavity, um, GI tract is the one I hate the most because you can have lost your entire blood volume in your GI tract before you ever see melana. It's amazing how much fluid the GI tract can hold. Um, muscle bellies, although honestly, if you've lost enough blood into a muscle belly, you should pick that up on your physical as far as an asymmetric finding. This thigh is three times the size of that thigh. That should be a tip off that there's something going on in the one thigh. And then joints as well. Uh, you, again, it's going to be hopefully picked up on a physical exam. Pericardium, you can bleed a significant amount into the pericardium, and some of these changes are also exacerbated by the fact of um, tamponade, but it's still a good tip to look in the pericardial space. So I will admit, um, you know, I, I grew up without an ultrasound, and I, my head spins on my body when my house officers pick up the ultrasound probe before they finish their physical, because I'm like, do your physical first. Um, but the one disease I'm super happy I have an ultrasound in the ER for is that pericardial effusion dog. Um, that's really helpful. All right. Now, we don't want to get total ton of vision because it's not 100% of the time that that low total solids is going to mean they're bleeding somewhere. But that's, again, I just want to rule things up or down. So what are the other things I need to consider? Well, besides blood loss, high protein transudates and exudates. Again, usually that's going to be in the belly. It's not going to be a huge diagnostic challenge. You've got a lot of fluid in the belly. It could be blood. It could be something else. I'm going to tap it, and I'm going to measure the protein and look at it. Protein-losing anaeropathy, in my world, most of those patients are pretty cachectic and have a long history of diarrhea. So I got some tips from that information. Protein-losing nephropathy is a bit harder for me to sort. Get some urine. If it has protein and blood within it, I'm kind of hard to sort it out. So I kind of have to look for the hemorrhage and try and rule it down through that mechanism. And then the other would be um, synthetic liver failure. The liver just can't make the proteins. But I can look at blood glucose. I can look at prothrombin time or activated thromboplastin time. Those will also rely on good liver function. So I can very quickly roll up or down synthetic liver function by doing a few other blood tests. So it's a pretty short list, and it works pretty well to help me in identifying some of these uh, patients that are bleeding internally that it's not obvious what was going on. All right, so what happened with Bistro? Sure enough, no big surprise, indoor outdoor cat, probably got hit by a car, hemoabdomen. Uh, got some IV fluids, um, some pain medication, because if I'd been whacked by a car, I'd want some pain meds. And then was discharged after a few days in the hospital. And the owners recognized that he might not have learned his lesson and decided to make him an indoor cat. 
I did have a client one time, literally the fifth time his dog had been hit by a car. Fifth time. I'm not kidding you. And I just looked at him, and he said, I really thought he'd have learned his lesson. I was just like, really? And I bit my tongue, but I almost spit out, and I thought you would have learned yours. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I bit my tongue. It probably wouldn't have gone over well. Uh, all right, so Angus. Angus is a seven-year-old castrated male cat who was presented in acute respiratory distress this morning. The owners report again that he was normal when they went to bed, and he is a strictly indoor cat. Physical exam is pretty minimal because this is a cat who's collapsed in an overt respiratory distress. So we can't do a full physical exam without risk of possibly tipping the cat over the edge. Um, very brief auscultation. He just has increased bronchovesicular sounds in all four quadrants. Um, and he has a two out of six peristeral murmur, which is reportedly historical. Additional clues, because we're always trying to sort out heart versus not heart, right? So additional clues, and I might not do it in this patient on initial presentation, but as I'm doing things stepwise, maybe I try and get a look at the jugular vein. Because if this, this, cat, um, this cat is pale, has kind of a slow CRT, so if, if he's shocky, and it's not just respiratory distress, if he's actually shocky as well, the two types of shock that it seems to be most likely to be are probably um, d um, cardiogenic or hypovolemic, although admittedly cats can be a bit more hypodynamic than dogs. But obviously, those are the big things we're worried about. Um, and at least with um, hypovolemic, would you expect a jugular vein to be standing up pretty nicely? No. And if it's cardiogenic shock, knowing that the vast majority of those patients are also in concurrent heart failure, would you expect the jugular vein to be standing up pretty well? Yes. So again, a very crude, just physical exam finding. It's not a slam dunk, but it might give you a little bit more evidence to kind of help tip you one way or the other, because that's lots of times what we're doing. We're looking for little bits of information that pull us one direction or another. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, though, is that jugular veins may be distended with a pneumothorax or with pleural effusion from any source. So again, not a slam dunk, but it is useful. If they're flat, that tells me something. Addition, yep. The question is, when they have congestive heart failure, wouldn't they be tachycardic oftentimes? Um, I don't know of any good studies in cats looking at actual heart rate, so this is just off the top of my head. I agree, dogs, pretty almost 100%, if you can ever say 100% of the time, you know, yeah, 99% of the time. Cats are full of trickery. And cats just don't do the tachycardic thing near as often as dogs. So it's not uncommon for me to have a cat come in in heart failure whose heart rate's 200, 180, 190. Sometimes 220, rarely above that. Cats just don't read the book. Or actually, maybe the book hasn't been written. All right, so the other thing you can think about doing is an NT Pro BNP, um, which is um, NT Pro BNP is natriuretic, um, natur 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 I can't say it, ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide. It's produced in response to myocardial stretch or strain. Um, and it may be useful in differentiating cardiac from non-cardiac causes of respiratory distress. And most of the work that's been done has been differentiating respiratory distress, not shock. However, we know that the vast majority in cardiogenic shock will have gone into congestive heart failure first. So it can be useful, I think, if you're really stuck trying to figure out what's going on with this patient. With that being said, a low value is probably better in ruling out congestive heart failure and cardiogenic shock than a high value is in ruling it in. And you have to always remember, just like almost any other test, it's not a standalone test. It needs to be interpreted in conjunction with other things. There are lots of papers out there uh, looking at it with respect to respiratory distress. Now, the CardioPet NT Pro BMP um, is something you have to draw the blood, send it in, and you get a value back, what, three, four days later, whenever the timing is. That's not very useful to me as an emergency clinician. In cats, we know that if the pro NP pro, pro BNP is greater than 270, that is strongly suggested of a significant heart disease. So I was really excited when I found out IDEX was coming out with a SNAP test. I was like, yay, this is going to you know, be so great for these respiratory distress cats that I can't figure out is it asthma or heart failure, et cetera, except that the SNAP test tells you positive or negative, and it's positive for anything over 100. And the work was done said that really the best correlation was, was values over 270. So does that mean it's a worthless test? No, because I would argue that if the NT Pro BMP is negative, it ain't heart failure and it's not cardiogenic shock. So it's got really good negative, pro negative value, but I think you have to be very careful interpreting a positive on that SNAP test. All right, but again, it's another thing out there that you might be able to find useful. 
All right. Um, so Angus was diagnosed with cardiogenic shock and congestive heart failure, no big surprise here, secondary to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He was treated and, and uh, survived to discharge, but unfortunately I think he was euthanized within a week or so later. He was a pretty sick cat. All right, Waffle. Waffle is a three-year-old castrated male Persian who's presented for um, vomiting, anorexia, and lethargy. It's been on, going on for a couple of days. He has no known dietary indiscretion. On presentation, temperature is 99, heart rate's 148, respiratory rate's 32, and he weighs about seven kilo. Um, he's got light pink mucous membranes with a capillary refill time of two seconds and is eight to 10% dehydrated. He's pretty, pretty flat cat. He's pretty collapsed. He's dull, but he is responsive. Um, and he's tachypnic with normal effort and normal bronchovesicular lung sounds. Pulse quality is fair. So my question is, is Waffle in shock? All right. What kind of shock is Waffle in? Could be hypovolemic. He's, the thing that's weird is he's bradycardic, right? His heart rate's only 148. That's not really expected. He is a cat, so we do anticipate trickery here. But we at least have some evidence for the kind of trickery. So with distributive shock in particular, cats are oftentimes bradycardic with distributive shock, which is very different than dogs. And this has been documented in two or three different studies. Um, so when I see that, I'm thinking, hmm, perhaps Waffle is uh, in distributive shock. And again, they tend to do more of a hypodynamic um, shock when they're septic than the cat. The other thing is it's just kind of a generalized rule of thumb. Again, as an emergency clinician, I'm always looking for the quick and easy. Um, flat cat equals septic cat until proven otherwise. You have a cat come in that's really flat on the table. In my mind, I need to rule up or down sepsis in that cat. Uh, again, before I go home and sleep, and that's why I don't get much sleep. So septic cats are much more likely to present hypodynamic, and what's really confounding about them is that slower heart rate. Uh, they are more likely to be hypothermic, pale, and bradycardic. Um, whoops. And so there's a fair number of stuff documenting the bradycardia. Um, common sources of sepsis in the cat, um, always the penetrating wound, especially the hiding bite wound, because cats are so good at grooming themselves. They can have a nice bite wound hiding under the fur uh, that you have to basically clip them to find. Hopefully it's a little bit painful so you get an indication of where to start clipping. Um, pyothorax, peritonitis, pyelonephritis, liver, et cetera. But um, common, pretty common to see septic cats, at least for us. With Waffle, there was some peritoneal effusion. We tapped it, it was a septic peritoneal effusion, so we knew we had a septic abdomen. Um, he, owners were up for it, so we did an abdominal exploratory. And no big surprise, um, there was a foreign body that resulted in intestinal perforation. He got intestinal resection and anastomosis, uh, treated for the septic peritonitis, and did actually okay. Ended up being one of those little um, soft earplugs like you get on the airplane. Yeah. They bounce around. Cats love to play with them. A really expensive pair of free little earplugs. Yeah. Yeah, cats, bad. All right. And then um, Damien. Damien is uh, my last case, but he's a longer case. I stuck the short ones in the middle. Um, so Damien is a four-year-old intact male pit bull. I figured that'd be positive with this crowd. <laughs> I actually love my pit bulls. Um, and he heard a rumor that Lolita down the street is in heat. She's sexy, isn't she? Mm -hmm. He decided to go check that out. And unfortunately, got nailed by the Lamborghini on the way. <laughs> All right. I had a little creative license with this one. It was late. All right. So primary survey when Damien first hit the door, uh, and I'll talk about this in my second talk on the technician track on triage. But primary survey, uh, neurologically, he was obtunded. Uh, it was pretty obvious right away. He had myotic pupil, slow PLR, and he was clearly non-ambulatory. We didn't even, it wasn't like we tried, but he was clearly non-ambulatory. Uh, cardiovascular, he was tachycardic with a heart rate of 180. Uh, no obvious murmurs or arrhythmias um, on initial auscultation. He had synchronous pulses. Um, he was pretty tachypnic but had normal bronchovesicular sounds in all of his lung fields. And his pulses were quite poor. His mucous membranes pale pink. And capillary refill time quite prolonged at three and a half seconds. Other things we observed uh, just initially were that he had episcleral hemorrhage, evident abrasions on his head, and his hydration was normal. I always joke with the students because um, 
you know, I'm like, typically dogs that get hit by a car, or cats for that matter, any species, they're not like throwing themselves in, the car, in front of the car trying to commit suicide because they're sick. So they're usually well hydrated and often, more often than not, relatively healthy animals. Unless you're the old geriatric dog that got the slow rollover in the driveway, right? Because you didn't get up and move. But, um, or you didn't hear them anymore, you didn't hear the car because you've gone deaf. Um, but most animals hit by car in my world anyway, pretty well hydrated if you get to them pretty quickly. Um, and uh, not usually got a lot of ter a huge number of other comorbid conditions. So looking at making a problem list and looking at differentials, he was a dog who was clearly in shock. Based on the history, we strongly sus su suspected it was hypovolemic shock, um, and his clinical signs fit that as well. Um, he had neurologic deficits and evidence of head trauma. I couldn't, though, say that his shock wasn't contributing to his mental status, because remember, if you're not perfusing your brain well, you may be obtunded, or ha at least I expect to have somewhat diminished mental status. But he had good evidence of head trauma as well, so I was worried about that. I think it's far less likely he actually has primary brain disease, some tumor or something up there. So those were my top uh, differentials for his major problems at this point. So this is not actually him, I'll be honest, but this is another real patient that was obviously very severely affected. And you can see the different information, some of the different information you get from a radiograph compared to a 3D CT reconstruction, which is always fun. Um, so when we think about head or traumatic brain injury, TBI, um, head trauma, we have to think about what's happening. And there's what we refer to as the primary brain injury, which is done at the time of the trauma. It is generally, for the most part, realistically irreversible. Um, and it results in an increase in intracranial pressure. So with um, primary brain injury, the things we're thinking about is the skull fracture. Is the hematoma inside the calvarium? Is the bleed into the actual brain parenchyma, not necessarily hematoma, inside the calvarium? Um, et cetera. So that's the primary injury. And unless you have the ability to do advanced imaging, like an MRI, and you have a client with deep enough pockets, and a surgeon with the skill set to do a craniotomy, it's usually out of reach, right, for a vast majority of patients that we see as well. Um, so primary injury, you're kind of stuck with. Um, the one thing I will say is if you have a skull fracture with that is um, that you've got unstable bone, that if it continues to be moved, you keep repeating the primary brain injury, right? You keep incurring additional primary brain injury. But, and so this is a difficult therapeutic target for most veterinarians. I get to do a little bit more of that kind of fun, fancy stuff because of where I work, but it's a, it's a difficult target. But what we can target therapeutically is what's known as secondary brain injury. And so that's what I wanted to focus on with Damien. Secondary brain injury, when I get that hematoma or I bleed into the brain itself, or I have a, a compressed skull fracture, the brain is sitting in an enclosed space. And now I've put something else in that space, the hematoma, bl blood outside the vessel, or whatever. And so what's going to happen to intracranial pressure when I've added a volume in this enclosed space is intracranial pressure is going to go up, right? Now, there can be a little bit of compensation in that some of the CSF can move out of the brain into the spinal cord space. But the only other room it's got to go, really, is for blood to be squeezed out. And then I get decreased perfusion of my injured brain tissue. Make sense? So primary injury is going to lead to increased intracranial pressure, which then is going to lead to inadequate oxygen delivery to the brain and just damaged brain. Maybe there's no oxygen delivery. Maybe there's disrupted vasculature. So I'm going to have portions, and maybe globally even, with increased intracranial pressure, depletion of oxygen delivery, which is going to lead to depletion of ATP for the cells. If cells don't have enough ATP or enough energy, they can't maintain those sodium potassium pumps on that cell membrane, right? So then sodium is going to rush into the cell down its concentration gradient because the pump is no longer keeping it out, and water follows sodium. So now we get edema. So now each of the cells is getting bigger, and as each of the cells gets bigger, what's happening to intracranial pressure? in that enclosed calvarium, it continues to go up. And it's just this vicious cycle. And then in addition to that, what starts to happen is you get activation of biochemical pathways. So you get uh, release of excito, uh, tran excitatory tra neurotransmitters, the influx of sodium and calcium, which sets up uh, the arachidonic acid cascade. Um, you get lipid peroxidation. Uh, you set up for really bad reperfusion injury. There are a lot of bad things that happen in the secondary injury. 
But the good news is those are all therapeutic targets for us, right? Can't do a whole lot about primary injury necessarily, but I can do a lot potentially about this secondary brain injury. But it's all going to revolve around decreasing intracranial pressure because that's the key here. So if we look at cerebral perfusion pressure, CPP, cerebral perfusion pressure relies on your mean arterial. It's calculated by mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. So just mathematically looking at this, well, cerebral perfusion pressure equals mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. If I hold mean arterial pressure steady, constant, and I'm increasing my intracranial pressure, what's automatically happening cerebral perfusion pressure? It's going down. Because if this, I'm subtracting ICP from MAP, that's going to go down. So my goal here is to maintain mean arterial pressure and to decrease intracranial pressure to try and optimize perfusion of that brain. Now, back, I don't know, 30, maybe 40 years ago, in people, they thought, well, maybe we just need to maintain supraphysiologic blood pressures, just looking at the formula, right? Would it make sense that if I actually give uh, my patient, make them more hypertensive in the face of intracranial pressure, then maybe we can maintain perfusion. And that actually went as far as a phase two clinical trial in people because head trauma, traumatic brain injury is a huge problem for us, especially young people. And so there's a lot of money invested in this. And this concept of maybe raising up to supraphysiologic blood pressures to try and preserve neurofunction failed. And they actually got worse outcome. So current recommendations are to maintain normal mean arterial pressure kind of at the higher end of the normal range. Just don't let it be low. Okay? So primary injury, again, we have these bleeds, skull fracture. Oftentimes the damage is done. Secondary injury, we know, leads to increased intracranial pressure. That's what we can address, um, and so that's what we're going to target. So it's all about getting oxygen and maintaining cerebral perfusion pressure and maintaining oxygen delivery to those brain cells. The most important thing to do in a trauma patient is treat them systemically first. If they have a pneumothorax, treat the pneumothorax because they're probably not oxygenating their blood very well. Okay? If they're shocky because they have a bad hemoabdomen and they're hypovolemic, give them volume. So Think about stabilizing the patient first, and then I'm going to give you a few tweaks for things you can incorporate when you have head trauma evident. So emergency treatment, we're going to always supplement oxygen, so oxygen via mask or cage. I don't like to put things in the nose on these patients because I don't want them to sneeze. When you sneeze, your intracranial pressure spikes, and I want to try and avoid that. I want to obtain a minimum database just like I would any trauma patient. Um, trauma patients probably going to get some IV fluids, and we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Again, I want to maintain blood pressure, and I'm going to be monitoring that frequently. And one of the things I'm going to be looking for that's going to be really scary to me is if my blood pressure gets high in the face of a bradycardia. That is classic for Cushing's reflex, ischemic CNS response, which probably means your brain is about to herniate, and I probably need to do something pretty dramatic to try and stop that from happening, all right, to try and decrease intracranial pressure. I'm going to give these patients analgesics. I want them to be pain-free because when you're painful, you have higher catecholamine surges, et cetera. I want to try and keep them comfortable. Plus, that's the humane thing to do. Um, and additional efforts to reduce intracranial pressure and brain injury we're going to go through. So in a trauma patient, I generally think, what are my resuscitation fluid options? I have my isotonic crystalloids. I have hypertonic saline. Again, if they're well hydrated, just in my standard trauma patient, Oftentimes, use hypertonic saline because that will pull fluid from the interstitial space into the intravascular space. And I can resuscitate them more quickly and with a smaller volume than just giving them lots of isotonic fluid. So that works quite well. If I have a patient who's really dehydrated, I don't use it because I don't have anything to pull on, right? Um, and then, obviously, in a patient who's in hypovolemic shock because of blood loss, I want to think about blood products. And that's something I'm going to keep an eye on as well. So those are usually my standard options in fluid resuscitation. I mentioned I want to talk a little bit about the hypertonic saline because osmotic agents um, are important, and especially, I'd say, in a trauma patient. Um, I use it a lot for a lot of trauma patients, but especially one with head trauma, evidence of head trauma. So remember that our osmotic agents, and hypertonic saline is hyperosmolar, just like mannitol is hyperosmolar, uh, and they work through their osmolality to reduce edema in all the cells of the body, including the brain cells, so it is effective for cerebral edema. It also reduces blood viscosity. So I have really narrowed vessels because, it, because my blood is less viscous. I can actually get red cells to deliver oxygen to places that maybe it wouldn't when my blood is more viscous. 
So osmotic agents have a lot of good indications, and I use them in patients that have signs of elevated intracranial pressure. That is what I will reach for as well as an osmotic agent if I detect that Cushing's reflex. I'll reach for that very quickly, and I will give some sort of osmotic drug, usually either hypotonic saline or mannitol. I'll talk about the two of them in a minute. Or if my patient's neurologic status is worsening. So mannitol is hyperosmolar. It remains in the intravascular space. It's not absorbed anywhere. Um, and the kidney freely re um, filters it. It's not taken up anywhere. Um, but then because it's really filtered in the kidney and it's osmotic, it causes an osmotic diuresis, right? So if I have a trauma patient who's hypovolemic, do I really want to induce a diuresis and pull volume? That's the reason I don't tend to reach for mannitol on my trauma patient who's also hypovolemic with head trauma. And instead, I'm going to reach for hypertonic saline because it's also hyperosmolar. It also has evidence of protecting the blood-brain barrier. It's a good resuscitation fluid overall. And it's okay with hypovolemia because it it's crosses the membranes. What is the, you know, when you're hypovolemic, is your body trying to hang on to sodium anyway? Yeah. Your brain and your kidneys are saying retain sodium. I'm just giving it more sodium. It's going to move across membranes and redistribute. We're going to be fine. And it's not going to induce a diuresis, all right, not an osmotic diuresis. So hypertonic saline is a better choice if your patient is hypovolemic than mannitol. The other things I can do very quickly are things like head elevation. Um, head elevation uh, will increase venous outflow, so kind of open up the drain to remove some of that pressure, make it easier to drain, and decrease intracranial pressure. And what's been shown to be the best angle is about 30 degrees. Now, I don't like to just put the head on a pillow because I'm worried I'm going to kink the jugulars, which are draining the brain. So I tend to, uh, lots of these patients are out on one of our wet tables with a grate. I just have the right size bucket that I put a bucket under the grate so the whole table basically is elevated. The thing is you have to make sure the dog doesn't just slide down the table. So sometimes I put a piece of tape around their butt to hold them in place. Um, and then don't be careful about, I don't, try to avoid jugular vena puncture. I don't want a thrombus. I try not to hold it off, bandages, et cetera. You want to make sure that things are draining um, easily because the jugulars drain the brain. I want to minimize elevations in cerebral metabolic rate, avoid hyper, hyperthermia or excitement. If they're running a little cool, it doesn't bother me. Probably protective for the brain. I don't want to make them hot. Um, I don't want them excited, so I'm going to use drugs to keep them quiet because all that activity increases oxygen requirement of the tissues. So if I can decrease the cerebral metabolic rate and demand of oxygen, I re result in less of a deficit up in the brain in those injured tissues. I also want to avoid seizures. So it's pretty common for us to use um, anti-seizure medications, but you want to use ones that have minimal effect on mentation and whatnot. So things like Keppra are pretty useful. Um, and I avoid drugs that might increase cerebral metabolic rate. Um, Hyperventilation, a lot of people ask about hyperventilation in these patients because if you hyperventilate, right, you'll drop the CO2, which then causes vasoconstriction and decreases the volume in the brain. Unfortunately, it also decreases the perfusion of the brain. So the only time we use hyperventilation is in patients who literally that Cushing's reflex that I need to do something very quickly to keep them alive while I get my hypertonic saline or at this point if they're normal volemic, my mannitol on board, or while I'm getting them to the OR for the surgeon to go fix the problem. All right, so hyperventilation only in the very short term, only in a crisis, like I really think they're about to arrest, um, and because it does reduce cerebral blood flow. And then it's important, obviously, we have to be doing serial neurologic evaluation on these patients, um, and it may need to be limited. I'm not getting them up and checking their CPs and hopping them and all that. It's a limited neuro exam, but you want to do it serially. Um, and it has been shown there's about three different studies that have been published now on veterinary patients looking at the utility of the modified Glasgow Coma Score. And definitely has been shown um, that um, it can be predictive of how your patient's going to do. And it's super easy to do. Um, hopefully it's big enough you can see. Um, there's three different areas that you assess. Um, motor, and again, um, we may not be doing this initially, but this patient was recumbent. Uh, some brain stem um, uh, tests to do, just uh, reflexes and then assess their level of consciousness. Uh, modified Glasgow Coma scores in dogs and cats, less than eight, it's pretty severe. Um, and you have better outcomes. At least one of the studies showed really good outcome, actually, with dogs that um, had an average or a median uh, modified Glasgow Coma score of about 13 and a half. So 
can be quite useful. We actually have this on our um, emergency room sheet in a little bracket so that anybody can just do a modified Glasgow coma score on any trauma patient that comes in. It's very easy and it's free. All right, <laughs> prognosis for head trauma. We don't have good published data actually in, in veterinary species and most will have at least um, pretty severe deficits at least initially. Um, but in my experience, most of them improve significantly if you just give them a few days. So I have owners that come in and they can't do the MRI and they wouldn't be able to go to surgery. I'm like, just, if we can just give him a couple of days, he may actually get much better pretty quickly. And if not, we can always stop. So I do always try and buy a little bit of time to see if they'll improve, because it's amazing. But then I also do say, you know, they could have um, deficits, et cetera. But boy, a lot of them will do really well, even when they start out looking pretty awful. And then the possible prognostic indicators, I talked a little bit about the modified Glasgow Coma score, um, the progression of signs, if they're getting worse, obviously that's a negative prognostic indicator. And then people are continuing to look at glucose levels. Hyperglycemia has been associated with a worse outcome, but it's unclear um, what that relationship really is. So keep looking in the literature for that, more information on glucose. All right, so Damien, our patient, initial database, um, his PCV was 46, total solids of 5.7. So what did we suspect in this patient? acute significant hemorrhage. His um, blood glucose we thought was probably elevated due to stress. Um, his lactate was 3.8, so a little bit high consistent with his hypovolemic shock. And he had a, um, lac a lactic acidosis as well. His electrolytes were pretty normal. Oh, sorry, I had that keyed wrong. I was wondering where that was. All right, so what happened with Damien? Um, he initially got a formula per kilo hypertonic saline bolus. Um, his response, his heart rate went from about 180 to 160. His pulses were still poor. His mucous membranes were minimally improved. So what did we do? What would you do? Lots of different answers. We gave him more fluids. Uh, gave him another hypertonic saline bolus. Um, and then ultimately over like the next hour as we were doing things and reassessing and doing things and reassessing, he ended up getting a total of about 60 mLs per kilo in isotonic fluids as well. Obviously, you can't keep repeating hypertonic saline without potentially getting into trouble with sodium levels, so you do need to kind of keep an eye on that. Um, usually, the body's pretty good at dealing with it, but in a head trauma patient, it might not be. So you do need to monitor. Um, and after the fluid therapy um, with the crystalloids, his heart rate had gone from 160 to 135. His pulses were improved to fair. His mucous membranes were now were still kind of a pale pink, and his CR tube was a bit improved, but still not optimal. So what do you think? What would you do? Okay, so we did some more assessment where we rechecked some of that point of care blood work. And his PCV is down to 19, total solids of 3.2. Um, and so this is a dog who, a couple hours ago, his PCV was probably 45. And very acutely, it's 19. So this is a dog who needs, again, and if I want to protect the brain as well, I need to ensure it's getting as much oxygen delivered to it as possible. So this is a dog that I hit my uh, transfusion trigger threshold, and we gave this dog packed red blood cells. So he got 15 mils per kilo of packed cells over an hour. And after that, his heart rate was down to 80. His pulses were st uh, still not perfect, but much better. His color was much better as capillary refill time normalized. Um, recheck PCV total solids were markedly improved. And ultimately, Damien went home. So take home points from today's lecture. We always want to maximize oxygen delivery to tissue, and especially with patients with shock. Always want to maximize oxygen delivery to the tissues to minimize organ dysfunction. When we treat shock, we don't just pick a number and give it. You treat shock to effect. So we're looking for improvement in those physical exam parameters that are very subjective, and I would strongly suggest you also use more objective parameters like lactate and base deficit. And we want to titrate our therapy to normalize those values. Um, early intervention optimizes outcomes. So the quicker you can jump on these things, the better outcome you'll have for your patient. Patients that arrive acutely ill, normal, otherwise relatively healthy, normal adult animals that arrive to you acutely ill, that have a total solids less than six, at least try and rule up or down um, acute significant hemorrhage in that patient. Uh, if you're really stumped on a patient with respiratory distress, that whether it's primary respiratory versus cardiac, or if you're really struggling with a patient that might be in cardiogenic shock, I think an NT pro BMP might be useful, only to rule it out, probably not as useful to rule it in. Remember, flat cats are frequently septic, and septic cats are frequently hypodynamic. Um, so again, cats just don't have the right book yet. And in patients with head trauma, systemic stabilization is the number one priority, and we want to try and reduce that secondary injury. 
And I always just remind owners, I know he looks really bad now, but prognosis with head trauma is hard to predict at presentation. So try and give him a little bit of time. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions.